As those of you who come every Friday know that uh, I often receive um, suggestions for the Friday night talk, please don't send any suggestions for the next month or two because I've got enough suggestions to keep me going for a long time. But this one has been waiting a couple of months now, and that was, um, they say I often give a talk about relationships, but what about those people who haven't got relationships? So this is a talk for the singles, for those people living by themselves, without a partner, maybe just uh, one person in a little apartment or a home or a house. So this is like single people and how to deal with it. And even if you are in a relationship, always remember that you were born by yourself, you will die alone. Yes, I know there may be people around the bedside, but you'll have your eyes closed in the end. and the last moments of your life, you'll be with yourself. And many times in your life, you will be by yourself. Of course, being a monk, I spend most of my time by myself, but I know how to deal with being a single. I know that when I first wake up in the morning, the first person I see is me. So I've got into this habit over many years. When I wake up in the morning, I say to myself, Good morning, me. Nice to see you again. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> and because I'm by myself, no one sees me saying that, so they don't think I'm crazy. <laughs> but why not say that? Because what that's doing is if no one else is around, to say sort of um, good morning to you, say it to yourself. Give yourself a boost of happiness. And uh, the last person I see before I go to bed at night is me. And so I say, good night, Ajahn Brahm. Have a great sleep. See you in the morning. <laughs> now what that actually does, you may think that's being a bit silly or stupid, but no, it's, it's using that status of being a single and giving it some positive energy. You're going to go to sleep, so just wish yourself well. You would not uh, believe just the power that has. For those of you who don't sleep well or have bad dreams, a lot of time it's because, you know, when, before you go to sleep, you put in bad thoughts, negative thoughts. You feel upset at the day and how it's been. Which is why if you learn a little bit of meditation, learn how to let go of the past, at least whatever's happened to you so far during that day, you can just totally let it go. I always say that uh, hopefully when you go to bed, when you climb into your bed, how many of you keep your shoes on when you go into bed? Sometimes, oh my goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, house slippers maybe, but not your shoes. So you've got two shoes. When you take your shoes off, the left shoe stands for your past, the right shoe stands for your future. Please don't take those two shoes into bed with you, the past and the future. Because if you let go of whatever's happened so far during the day, and you let go of what's going to face you in the tomorrow, then at least you can sleep well tonight. And I keep on saying, oh, I don't know why people worry so much, because it probably won't happen anyway, and in fact it usually doesn't happen. Everything I was ever afraid of in life never happened, usually something much worse. <laughs> or sometimes something much better as well. But I can never really predict the future, so I'll just forget about it. And have a good night's sleep. So, just not letting go of the past, letting go of the future, just like kids do. I mean, there's be a few kids, you know, she's just getting ready for bed over there. And I'm going to be talking, she's not worried about a thing. So kids are great, you can learn so much from children. They don't carry the past or the future, which is why they can sleep anywhere at any time. But also, more than that, you know, she's got a dad next to her and a mum behind her, which means that she feels comfortable, she feels loved, she feels safe. So if you want to have a good night's sleep, feel comfortable, feel loved. Let go of the past, let go of the future, and be kind to yourself. A lot of insomnia comes because of no fear, and just being kind, being loved, means you can have a great night's sleep. So this is just an introduction to just being single. And the point is, this is a basic uh, Buddhist principle, uh, which I'm going to start with the Buddhist principle, and then expand it just to how we can 
adapt this to being single or being married or being in a threesome or a foursome, I don't care what you do. The most important thing is how you do it. And this is basic law of karma. The karma, people misunderstand this in Buddhism, the karma from your past gives you the ingredients, where you are right now, the people you're with, the body you're in, the place you're living in, you know, your finances, your health, that's a result of the karma from the past. Okay. So now that's not the most important part. That's the past, you can't do anything with that. But what are you doing with what you've got? What are you doing with your ingredients? That's a karma of the present. Now that really is important. So it doesn't matter what you have to deal with in life. How are you dealing with it? What are you making out of this? And you know this sort of the story, this is a basic story. The, uh, the baking a cake, you have the worst ingredients, you have the best ingredients, who makes the best cake? Who makes the best food, the celebrity chefs with the most expensive ingredients or the hawkers on the street? Who makes the best? Hawkers make the best quite often and it was actually, I told this the last time I mentioned this simile, it's a classic simile. There was a, a cook-off between some celebrity chef in Singapore, because I was there, read the Straits Times, and one of the, and the street hawkers. You know, and, okay, here's a celebrity chef Hear the street hawkers make a dish and get the general public to judge who makes the best. And they didn't know, you know where the food came from. The street hawkers, they won. Much more delicious food than the celebrity chef. And the reason is, is because yes, they didn't have as much training, they didn't have the best ingredients, they didn't have these, these really modern high-tech kitchens, but they had what they did with what they've got was immense. So, and this was a case in point of where it's not the ingredients you have in your life, but what you make of them is what the important part of karma is. So it doesn't really matter, you're a boy or you're a girl, you're old or young, whatever race you are, whether you are gay, transgender, uh, straight, whether you are a monk, whether you are not celibate, whether you are this race or that race, this religion or that religion, that is not the point. The point is, what are you doing with what you've got? And that's where you see, I don't know if you've got Christmas cards, you know, they still send me Christmas cards. I say, please don't send me Christmas cards, call them Buddhamas cards. So I say, Merry Buddhamas, that's, a <laughs> that's okay. But they send me these cards, and some of these cards, they see they're painted, you know, by people with no hands. You know, with these, they're painted by people's feet. And you know, I can't even paint with my hand, and how these people can actually paint these masterpieces with their feet is incredible. And it's just an example of what can be done with you know, the little you have. And that really inspires me. Every time I see someone who has come from a really, really bad background, sexually abused, and they say, it doesn't matter, I'm going to make something amazing out of this. And they make a beautiful life out of it. You see, sometimes people who come from incredibly poor backgrounds, you know, racially discriminated against, but they say, I don't care, I'm going to make something out of this. And when they do, that's really inspiring. It's inspiring, it's true, it gives you hope. No matter what's happened to you in your life, you can always make something out of it. That's the karma of the present moment. And just to complete that simile, which many of you heard before, life sometimes gives you shit. When it does, don't throw it away. It's fertilizer. Dig it under the mango tree. One year later, your mangoes will be sweeter than ever, because it's mango season now in Perth. You get so many mangoes. Where did those mangoes come from? They came from shit. <laughs> so you must always remember, when you eat that mango, what fertilized it. <laughs> and that's an example of what happens is that all the difficulties in life, if you know how to use them, you can make beautiful juicy mangoes out of anything. Now this is reason why we say the law of karma is something which is not fatalistic, but gives you incredible opportunities, no matter who you are, 
no matter what has gone on in your life so far, no matter whether you are gifted with this or you are um, you know, challenged by you can't see properly, you can't hear properly, it doesn't matter. What are you doing with it? Now this is a general principle. You can make a great life out of almost anything. Obviously some, actually I won't say that it's more hard work. Sometimes it's really hard work making a good life when you're gifted. Because many gifted people become so conceited and they become lazy. Basically they don't have to try and pour forth effort in life. You know, life is just given to them on a plate. And because they haven't gone through tough times, because they haven't had any struggle in their life, they become very weak, selfish, conceited. They don't work hard enough. If you have had trouble and difficulties in life, it's hard work, but my goodness, you get a good result afterwards. You really become wise and compassionate, and I've seen that. So going back to singles, it does not matter whether you are single or married. It's how you do it, how you do being a single. And one of the nice things about our modern world is now you can be whatever you want. You don't have to get married. You know, just only 30, 40 years ago, you know, if you weren't married, people thought there was something terribly wrong with you. You know, that uh, it was a social stigma and your parents would just get on your back. Come on, get married. You know, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50. Now, this is especially so, you know, in Asian countries. And I just come back from Penang and from Singapore. And many people, they get a lot of pressure from their parents, you know, to get married. You don't have to do that. It's your choice, and it's, you can live a wonderful life just being a single. You have that choice, that right, and that privilege to be single. However, those people who are single, they're the ones who want to find a partner. Those who have a partner want to be single. <laughs> And this is the problem of life. We're never satisfied, we always want something different. And this reminds me of a story which is in my new book, Good, Bad, Who Knows, available in the office, if it's still any left. In that book, I told a story of the farmer with mouldy hay. A long time ago, this Aussie farmer had a whole lot of hay which was from last year, which was mouldy. And of course, trying to save costs, he wanted to give it to his cows before he would give them the new hay. But the cows, they knew that was mouldy old hay, so would they eat any of it? No, they refused to eat it. So plan number two, let's mix it up with the good hay, the new hay, the mouldy hay and the new hay, mix it all up together and the cows won't know what's what and they'll eat it all. That way it gets rid of the old hay. And the cows were much smarter than the farmer. They just, with their noses, push the old hay to one side, push the new hay to the other side and let the, the new hay. It's just like the kangaroos in Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine. Because when we go on retreat, you know, we take food, the food is given to us, we've got all this food, the monks give us far too much. And you know, a lot of time we put the excess food out for the kangaroos. Now people might say, oh, that's bad for the kangaroos. Ask the kangaroos, they don't think it's bad, they love it. <laughs> and so I remember the first time I did that. You know, you care for the animals, so give them some healthy food, some carrots, some lettuce, and some apples, and stuff. But I couldn't believe the first time I did that, had some really healthy food there for the, ca for the kangaroos. They, with their nose, they pushed aside the carrot. They pushed aside the lettuce. You know what they went for? The pizza. <laughs> <laughs> they did. And they, they left all the healthy food. They loved pizza. And I think this is the only carrots in the whole of Australia who get pizza. And the kangaroos in a, in a Buddhist monastery. Because it's their good karma to be reborn in a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> they get pizza. No other kangaroos get that. <laughs> and they like it, they love it so good on them. And you know, some of those kangaroos, you know, they know the monks now, and because the monks are just so kind, you know, and so sort of uh, gentle. I remember it happened to me once, you put your bowl just outside the door, you just go inside to get something, and before you know it, the kangaroo's got his nose in your bowl, and that's your one meal of the day. And he's getting the first choice, you know, going in the bowl looking what he wants. <laughs> It's nice living with animals, but anyway, just 
they, so the the cows pushed aside the the, the hay they didn't want and uh, ate the hay they did want. So he's still left with all this mouldy hay. And didn't know what to do next until he got a brainwave, an insight. He should have done this to start with. If ever you go into you know, the countryside and you see cows in a field or sheep in a field, have you ever noticed there's always a fence around you know, to keep the cows away from the road? But the cows or the sheep love putting their head through the fences and eating the grass just on the other side of the fence. You'll always see that well eaten, well grazed. So what he did, very simple solution, he put all the mouldy hay, not in the paddock, but outside of the paddock. Now, away from the fence, but just far enough, if they really stretched, they could just get it. And the mouldy hay was gone in a day. <laughs> Anything which is forbidden, Anything which you don't know, anything which is just on the other side of your fence, is very delicious. I know that people did once say that hunger is the best source. No, that's not the best source. Being forbidden is the best source. You try that. If you tell your child, you can't eat this, then you'd be very hungry for it. <laughs> anything which is banned and forbidden is somehow very tasty. And I, I have to tell this story. I don't know if they're here today. There was a Malaysian girl here, married to an Australian guy. She'd been coming here for so many years. And she realized the great benefit you know, of what's being taught here, the meditation, the attitudes, the philosophies, the advice. And of course she loved her husband very much. She thought, if only he could could hear some of this or listen to some of these talks, you know, he'd love it. But you know, being an Australian, religion, no way. You know, he was one of these guys, you know, who thought religions were just into getting your money, didn't believe in anything after life. It was just, you know, some some old um, antiquated uh, sort of uh, culture whose use by date was past centuries ago. So it was just really down on all religions. So when she asked him to come, no. You can go, but I'll go down pub. So she asked me, how can I get my husband to come to this place? So very easy. No problem at all. Guaranteed 100% all your money back. You don't pay any money to come in here, so it's a very easy guarantee to make. <laughs> Even all of the books, if you buy one of my books, I always give the money back guarantee. If you don't like any one of my books, any book which has got my name underneath, if you don't like any one of my books, and I say this in front of the board, in front of all of you, you can always ask for your money back. 100% guarantee. If you don't like any of the books, you can always ask for your money back. You won't get it back, but you can always ask. <laughs> so I don't lie. Okay. <laughs> so, so I told this girl, buy one of my books, take it home, and tell your husband. As soon as you get in the door, say, darling, this is a Buddhist book, it's a holy book, keep your hands off it. You're not allowed to read it. That's all, very quick. And of course you know what's going to happen next. You know, he, she was uh, a couple of days later out shopping or something. He was at home. You know what an Australian guy thinks? What does she mean? I can't read this book. And so he picked it up and read the first uh, story, and he didn't finish until he put it. He didn't put it down until he finished. Read the whole book one sitting, and he started coming. I don't know if he's here today, uh, but you know, but that actually works. So if you want something, tell your kid, if he's not doing well at school, you're forbidden to do homework next year. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that, the kids are much smarter than I am. <laughs> but that's what happened with the cows. Because it was the other side of the fence, it always looked more delicious. Now that's being a single or being married. If you're single, you always think that once I get a, a, a partner, then I'll be happy. It's the, the old thing of the unknown on the other side of the fence being a bit more delicious and a bit more fun. But it's not. Just ask people who are married before you want to go and find somebody. Just ask. You know, do a survey. You know, just listen to all the jokes about marriage. 
which one of my favourite marriage jokes is about this couple here in Perth. Now when they were courting, when they were going out together, he would always hold her hand, all the time. After 30 years of marriage, he still holds her hand. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. When he was going out with her, he'd hold her hand out of love. After 30 years of marriage, he holds her hand out of self-defense. <laughs> now, why are you laughing? <laughs> because you can recognize the truth of that sometimes. <laughs> it's not always true. So when you actually start thinking about it, you know, they, they have some very happy marriages, have some wonderful times together. There's a lot of happiness in marriage. And sometimes people ask me, is, is it okay for Buddhists to get married? Is it a spiritual cop-out? You know, when you're supposed to be having no attachments. It is sort of, you know, it's a 50-50. Yeah, I mean, you get attached to somebody, but you also have to let go of what you want to do when you get married. It's always a sort of letting go of control, letting go of your choices. When you're single, you can come and go wherever you want, whenever you want. But when you're married, you've got another person to think about. So there is always a letting go when you have a, a relationship. So, you know, there is a spiritual um, benefit of having a relationship. But there's also sort of the benefit of being single as well. Being single, I mean, you don't have so much responsibilities and attachments. So there's benefit either way. So again, you can't say that one is better than another. All you can actually say is, what do you do with being single? Or what do you do with uh, being in a partnership? Again, it's always what you make of it. That's the law of karma. I know sometimes, you know, what life, for those of you in a relationship, sometimes, you know, it just happens. A lot of you don't plan these things, you know, just you meet someone and then one thing leads to another and the next thing, you know, you just got your, your handcuffs on. Those are called the rings. <laughs> <laughs> I call them handcuffs or finger cuffs. But then you're married together, okay? So a lot of times, have you not noticed that life is not planned? You don't actually go decide, no, I'm going to go out today and I'm going to meet the love of my life and I'm going to get married. If you do, it doesn't work. It just happens. At the same time, being single, you can't just plan, oh, I'm going to be single. Or I'm going to, just like me being a monk. I never planned being a monk. Just, you know, woke up one morning, I had no hair and brown robes. And just, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> so, you know, it's... Sometimes you're, 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 what happens in life is like, you know, just a series of events almost meant to be. Not really meant to be, but you know, you can see it was just totally out of control. And that's a nice thing to understand. It's a deeper teaching of Buddhism. You know, life is out of control. So, take it easy. Don't worry. It's all out of control. If it was, you know, in your control, then you have a lot of worry, to worry about. It's what His Holiness the Dalai Lama once said, only worry about things you can, you can make a difference with. But well, if something you can do, then fair enough, put forth some method and do it. But a lot of times you can't do anything, so why worry about something you cannot do anything about? And a lot of times that's your life. It just happens or it doesn't happen. You can't do much about it. So just enjoy the journey. If the journey means you're going to be together with a couple, if your journey means you're just going to be single, just make the most of it. And so if you are single, the first thing is, don't feel that you're missing out. People ask me that, said, as a monk, I've been in monk almost 40 years now, do you think you've missed out on life? And I said, I've missed out, I have missed out on having to get up early and go to work in the traffic every Monday morning. I've, I've, <laughs> I've missed out on being woken up in the middle of the night by this little being screaming their head off. I'm talking about the wife. <laughs> you said it was a baby, didn't you? <laughs> so it's not a case you missed out. All of life you miss something, you gain another thing. It's all pretty even in life, no matter what happens. But the point is, do you really want to be somewhere else? Or are you just happy being single? Now that's the most important part of, of Buddhism. We always call it, this is my simile of the freedom and the prison. I often usually um, talk about this during retreats, not here on a Friday night. But you know, freedom and being in a prison. 
What's the difference? I've been in many prisons, you know, helping out, teaching, looking after other prisoners, teaching them how to meditate. I always love telling the story. The first time I went to give a talk on meditation in one of the prisons here in Western Australia. And it was the old Canning Vale Jail, I think it's now called Hakey or whatever it's called, or whatever. But anyway, I gave a talk there on meditation and I was really so impressed. There was about 110 prisoners in those days, maybe 30 years, 30, yeah, about 30 years ago. And about 105 turned up for my talk. I got about 95% of the prison population coming to my talk on meditation. I just couldn't believe just how interested these people were. And so, you know, if they're going to come to my meditation class, I'm going to really come and teach you as best I possibly could. So I really started teaching about meditation. After five minutes, one of the prisoners put his hand up, stood up to ask a question, interrupted me right in the middle of my talk. But if you saw this guy, he was now about six foot across the shoulders, <laughs> tattoos, scars, really a big guy. And when someone like that asks you a question, you say, yes, what do you want to ask? <laughs> and his question is, and it, he was one of the leaders, one of the gang leaders inside the prison. He, he became a very good friend after many weeks. You know, had a really, I well, always, always wonder what happened to him. But anyway, he, came, he stood up and he said, is it really true that through meditation you can levitate and fly over walls? And then I realized <laughs> why all these prisoners had come to my meditation class. <laughs> this is not a joke, this happened. And when I said, you know, maybe just you know, after maybe 30 or 40 years of meditation, if you're very gifted, maybe, maybe one or two of you could do that after so many years. When I went back next week, only three people turned up. <laughs> you know, you've got some great experiences as a monk. But, <laughs> but on this one occasion, I'll tell it in brief, because there was one of our monks went to teach in Kajarina jail. After a few weeks, they liked him very much. They asked him after, you know, he let, uh, as he was about to leave, can't you stay for another half an hour? We'll get you a cup of tea. Because we want to ask you about life as a monk. What do you do? And he gave all the story about life in Bodhinyana Monastery Serpentine. Getting up at four o'clock, it's optional. You can always get up earlier if you want to. Just you know, eating a tiny breakfast, which is what we eat there. Just one meal of the day, just in, all in a one bowl. Everything gets mixed up. Yes, only just a few weeks ago I had strawberry ice cream on my spaghetti. It all gets mixed up. Did you say yuck? How many people go, ugh, that was a strawberry ice cream on spaghetti. Have you ever had strawberry ice cream on spaghetti? Have you? You don't know what you're talking about when you go, yuck. <laughs> Actually, you're quite true, it is yucky. <laughs> it's terrible. But, you know, that's what you have to do. And they were saying, oh, even in solitary confinement, you get a little tray with compartments. No, we don't have any compartments in our bowls. It all goes together. And, you know, you can't play any sport. You know, there's no sex. You can't play cards. You know, no TV, no movies. Just meditate all day and go to bed on the floor. I sleep on the floor. And it actually is an ascetic place by, by many standards. Those of you who've stayed in Bodhinyana Monastery, you know, it's, uh, or even the nuns' monastery, isn't it? quite austere. It certainly is more austere than staying in a prison here in Australia. And when they heard this, one of the prisoners, totally forgetting where they were, said this remarkable phrase, which we always remember, when he heard how bad the conditions were in the monastery where their monk, who they got to lie, was staying, one of the prisoners blurted out, that's terrible in your place. Why don't you come and stay with us instead? <laughs> <laughs> he was invited into jail. <laughs> and they had a point. You know, if I went to jail, I could watch TV and have three meals a day, four meals of the day, be able to play sport, I'd have great fun in there. So I'm not afraid of going to jail. That would be like holiday for a monk. And I often tell, if ever I wanted to have a retreat, just be by myself for a couple of months, do some meditation, punch a prison officer, two months solitary. I might have a wonderful time. <laughs> but, 
Why is it a big waiting list in Bodhinyana Monastery? What's the waiting list now? Is it 16, 17? Something like that, 17 people waiting for the chance to get in and become a monk. Is there a waiting list of people trying to get into jail? There's a lot of waiting lists trying to get out. So I said, what is a prison? And it's very clear from that sort of little story, a prison, it doesn't matter how austere, how painful, how uncomfortable it is. If you want to be there, it's not a prison anymore. If you want to be somewhere else, even if it's very comfortable, and you're having a wonder, you know, it's, it's a luxurious, comfortable, you have all these gizmos. If you don't want to be there, it's in a prison. The only difference between freedom and being in prison is whether you want to be there or whether you want to be somewhere else. And that's what we mean by being single. If you're happy being single, then you're free. If you want to be somewhere else, the state of being single is a prison for you. Same as if you're in a marriage you hate, and you want to sort of separate, you want to be by yourself again, then your marriage is a, f a prison for you. We have so many prisons we make in life. Some of you are very sick with cancers or other problems. Are you happy being there, or do you want to be somewhere else? All of those who are getting old, like me, is your old age a prison, or is it freedom? If you're happy being old, you feel so free. If you want to be somewhere else, or something else, you have made another prison for yourself. We all make so many prisons in life. Any place you don't want to be becomes a prison. Even if you're sitting here, and you want to be somewhere else, you've heard this before, you want to go somewhere else, this place here, this hall, this Buddhist center becomes your prison for you. It's not a case of how austere life is or how difficult it is being single. It's everything to do with whether you want to be here or whether you want to be something else. Which is why if you're single, if you want to be happy, just be single. Enjoy it. It's wonderful. It's just like people being sick. Sickness is a prison when you don't appreciate it. Sickness means you don't have to go to work. People pamper you. You can get special food. You can actually even get breakfast in bed. If you've got a good partner, it's nice to you. So sometimes, be careful though, if you pamper your partner too much, they won't want to get better. <laughs> they like being sick. I was just, this one of the ladies that came to my monastery today, I never forget her, her father, I went to go and see him in the, the hospice over in Murdoch in uh, St. John of God. You know, he was, you know, lung cancer, I forget what it was, but he was dying. But you know, in that hospice, they looked after him so well, for years having cancer, there's so many foods he was not allowed to eat. But in the hospice, they so you're dying, you're going to be dead soon, so you can eat whatever you want. You don't have to worry about cholesterol and diabetes and stuff like that, because you're dying. They said it was wonderful. For the first time in about three or four years, he could eat his fish and chips, he could eat whatever he wanted, as ever much, whatever he wanted. He hadn't been able to have that for years. And so once he started eating all this food he really liked, he started to get better. After a couple of weeks, he was released. <laughs> True. He died later on, but you know, he had such a wonderful time in the hospice, being so free to eat whatever he wanted, <laughs> that actually he got better. <laughs> Isn't that telling you something? And so a lot of time is, do you want to be here, do you want to be somewhere else? So, okay, you're single, okay? So, look at the benefits of it. Don't look on the grass on the other side of the fence, no, that, and the, the, that stuff, that's what I want. So make the best of being single. It just sometimes happens, you can't have plans. Sometimes you just meet somebody, and, you know, just go out together. And you know, that happens many times. Life is out of control. I remember many times, these guys have come to Bodhinyana Monastery, you know, I'm the abbot there, they say, this is it, I really want to become a monk now, i am left the world. And so they stay there for a few months, or a few months, then they say, right, before my ordination, I'm just going home just to tie up a few loose ends. Two weeks later, get the letter saying, I'm not going to become a monk, I met this wonderful girl, and we've fallen in love. And that's the last I hear from them. <laughs> And 
they're not making that up, it just happens in life. So sometimes, uh, you know, all the plans you have, let's forget all the plans. You know, plans, okay, I'm going to be single, I'm going to be single forever, oh God, what am I going to do with this? Just enjoy it. Or sometimes I'm going to go out looking for Mr. Right. If you do find Mr. Right, you'll find you always have arguments because he's always right. That's why they call him Mr. Right. So you're always going to have a lot of trouble, whatever way. So, you know, you have single person suffering, just learn how to enjoy it. But of course, the biggest problem with being single is that sometimes people do actually feel lonely. Now this is a problem that they think they need someone to share their life with. You have someone to share your life with, and of course that is yourself. And this is the only reason why people who are single have suffering. It's because they haven't got a friend. And I mean, they're not a friend to themselves. That's why one of the reasons I am a monk, I've lived in solitude for a long time. My record was six months uh, in a hut over in Bodhinyan Monastery in Serpentine, where I never saw or spoke to a human being in six months. Just total solitude. And people say, no, you go crazy. Don't you feel lonely? I never felt lonely. Because there was always someone there. Me. I was there. And I have a good relationship with me. Actually quite like me. You know, sometimes I tell myself jokes. I actually laugh at my own jokes. <laughs> They're funny. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, so you have a good relationship with yourself, which means you're always with your best friend. And who that is? It's me. <laughs> Some jokes I, I haven't got the, the nerve to say yet, so I just one came to my head, but that's going a bit too far. I'm going to get into big trouble. <laughs> Okay, it's already in here, so it's coming out. If you want to sort of uh, put your hands over your kid's ears, please do so. About the guy who was in the pub, and he's drowning his sorrows, and said, you know, what's, what's going on? He said, oh, I had an early morning off work, and, I, and, I, and I, I caught my wife in bed with my best friend. He said, what do you do? I told my wife, that's it, pack your bags, get out. What do you do for your best friend? I looked at him and said, bad dog, bad dog. <laughs> <laughs> Best friend. <laughs> if you don't want to come here next week, if I'm bad. <laughs> That's wonderful. Then I can have a nice rest in Burning the Island Monastery. I always tell people that I really want to upset enough people so I can be left alone and live a life as a nice quiet monk. It doesn't seem to work. The more outrageous I become, the more people want to come and listen to more, <laughs> more of the same. <laughs> so anyway, I've got a good relationship to myself, which means when I'm by myself, you know, I'm quite happy and quite content. And that's the difference between, between solitude and some, you know, isolation or being alone, feeling that there's something wrong. It's just a relationship you have with yourself, whether you like yourself or not. Where you can say, forgive yourself. For a long time ago, I forgave myself from telling bad jokes. And the reason is, I worked it out. Why do I tell bad jokes? And it was because my father told bad jokes when I was young. He conditioned me. <laughs> and because he conditioned me, it's just brainwashing. That's all. I got those bad joke genes in me from my father. <laughs> and it's, it's absolutely true. I still remember, you know, you know this uh, story, this joke, about now I'm telling bad jokes. Here comes the next one. I remember when he told me this joke about what fun does a monk have? What fun does a monk have? And the answer was, this is my father, not me. He said, what fun does a monk have? The answer is none. <laughs> now that's not true with very good monks, you know, in Bodhinyana Monastery. But, you know, that was from my dad, okay? So that just gets into your, your consciousness and that just, that's who you are. So I don't blame myself, which means that I'm not going to feel guilty for telling terrible, bad jokes in a, in a holy place like this. <laughs> now, do you make mistakes? Have you made done really bad choices and done things wrong? What do you do with that? If you feel guilty, if you feel negative, then you get into this punishment thing. And this punishment thing is, I don't deserve happiness, freedom, peace. 
I don't deserve a relationship. Look, there's a lot of people out there who are single, cannot get a relationship simply because they psychologically destroy any possibility of happiness because they think they don't deserve to be happy. Which is why if you have a look at that book, Good, Bad, Who Knows, one of the other things you see there is the happiness license. You know, there are so many people who think they don't deserve to be happy, and they respect me a lot, so I decide to give them a happiness license. Now, a nice, um, a nice headed note paper, uh, signed by me, it says something like, I hereby give, blah, blah, blah. I hereby give, uh, who can I say who deserves to be happy? Who's really miserable these days? My man, let's say, here we go, I'm getting into trouble again, Mr. Putin in, in, in Russia. I give, hereby give Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, permission to smile. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen him smile. Have you seen him smile? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get the KGB or the after me this evening, I don't know. But anyway, I give permission for someone to be happy and signed by me. And they respect me enough to actually, they take that and they put it on their wall and they realize, I deserve to be happy. It's okay when happiness comes, when success comes, when I have a relationship, I'm not going to destroy it because of some guilt, which I've, you know, of, of something I've done years and years and years ago. Ask any psychologist, happiness licenses from someone you really respect are very powerful. So that's one of the reasons you haven't got a, a, good, a good relationship with yourself, which is why when you are alone, you just can't, can't stand it. And when you do try and get a relationship, you bust it up. It's as if you're destroying any possibility of happiness and success for yourself in life. So that's the next thing to look at. So have you done anything wrong in your life? If you've done anything wrong, join the club <laughs> of humanity. You know, that we've all done big mistakes. There's another thing in that book, I brought my three biggest mistakes, or three mistakes which I can remember, the ones I haven't, I haven't um, uh, shot to the back of my mind with denial. But these are the ones which, you know, some mistakes which you make in life. What was one of those mistakes? Oh, I, I think I told this in Singapore the other day, when I was really tired. You know, I do get tired because I work really hard. And I was give, doing a, a, a wedding blessing. You know, doing a traditional chant for, for, for weddings in Buddhism. Because I was tired, I did the funeral chant instead of the wedding chant. <laughs> Got it wrong. <laughs> and they didn't understand. They just heard this, this Sanskrit party chant. They didn't know what I was chanting. But <laughs> So that's what I've done. But you know, the amazing thing is they're still together. <laughs> it didn't really matter. So yeah, I make mistakes, do stupid things, but I'm not going to punish myself. I'm going to tell everybody, because it makes people laugh when you make mistakes and you tell them you're a human being. And that's wonderful. So please, please celebrate your mistakes in life. Don't feel guilty about them. Don't punish yourself for them, which means as a, a single person, you can actually have a good relationship with yourself. And of course, that little story of opening the door of your heart, that has to happen to each one of you sooner or later, whether you're single, whether you're with a partner, old, young, please, sooner or later, and sooner is better than later. You know, in a nice, quiet place, in your favorite place in the world, a place you feel comfortable and safe and loved, please tell yourself, whatever I have done, everything and anything, by body, by speech, or even thought, which has hurt someone else, or hurt myself, the things which I'm really ashamed of, I forgive them. The door of my heart is open to all of me. Not just the part you like, not just the part you're proud of, but the part you'd, you'd rather never have done. Open the door of your heart to all of you. And somebody told me that they were doing that to themselves when I was, this was in Penang. And they actually saw these, like the images of themselves. You know, the, the same face, the same hair, the same usual figure and clothes. But all dark and lonely, rejected. The part of themselves which had always been kept out of their own hearts. Because you were ashamed of that. And I imagined... You know, the staircase, a ladder, 
you know, from down there into their heart, into their chest, and these little guys walking up and coming home. And just, you know, their image of themselves, hugging these people, part of you, you know, your history, your past, which you'd always kept outside. And as soon as they could do that, the whole of themselves got united. They, they felt they were united at last. And all of that self-hate, the sense of guilt, the part of themselves which they rejected, totally vanished, which meant when they were by themselves, they were perfectly content and happy. When they were with other people, they weren't afraid of having happiness and love. But they had to do that first. If you cannot be a friend to yourself, if you cannot be single and love being single, you're never going to have any real hope of having a relationship. If you've got no relationship with yourself, how on earth can you have a relationship with others? Your relationship with, from others, with others will just be an escape of running away. Relationship is about facing, being with, not running away from. And you find that if you have that beautiful relationship with yourself, whether you're by yourself with others, you're as happy both ways. So when you are single, just check that out. And it doesn't matter if you are married, you're in a big family, you're all going to find some time when you are single. When your partner dies, when they go overseas for a while, there's always those times when you're single. And even those people who are single, there'll be always those times you're with somebody else. You know, life is not just one extreme. You always have many hours of your life by yourself, and many hours of your life in the company of others. If you get being single right, then being with others is just so, so easy. Now look at me, because I'm supposed to be a hermit, I'm supposed to be a monk, I'm supposed to be living in my cave, meditating, becoming wise and powerful and you know, whatever you expect of a monk. But I end up just spending so much time with you guys. And just, what am I doing? You know, I never really wanted to do that. When I was young, remember this story, <laughs> here we go. I, four years as a monk, no, five years as a monk, looking for a place for solitude. Went up to the north of Thailand. This was many years ago, 36 years ago. The north of Thailand found this really secluded monastery, these lovely caves, having a wonderful time there until they had a big celebration. It was Waisak Day. So all these people from the surrounding villages and towns came to this monastery. And I didn't mind people being around if they wanted to ask some questions about Buddhism or meditation. But you know they never asked any questions about that. They just came out to me because I was one of the first Westerners they'd seen, let alone a Western monk. So they all came up to me and said, what country are you from? You know, and what does your mother and father do? And how many brothers have you got? And why do you become a monk? And, you know, it's okay, you know, you're kind enough to answer those questions, but there's nothing really serious. When about 30 people have come up and asked you that same question, you get a bit pissed off. <laughs> so, what did I do? How to escape? I need to go to the toilet. People always let you go to, well not always, but sometimes they do. So I went off to the toilet, and of course I never came back again. I went to my hut, I got a flashlight, I got a bottle of water, and a, did I have a cushion? No, a flashlight, a bottle of water, and then I went into one of the caves. A, the deepest cave, you know, in these limestone mountains. Maybe about 40 or 50 meters deep. But the air was okay in the bottom. You had to go up, sort of a uh, little ladder, you know, cross this and cross that, and go around these winding, winding little chambers until you came to the very, very end. It was so quiet in there. And so I sat down there. At last, I could have some solitude. About 10 minutes, that's all solitude I had. Because what happened next, I could hear people coming. What had happened was, you know, the abbot was giving a sermon. Really boring, no jokes. They got fed up. So they said, let's go and explore the caves. And they decided to explore my cave. <laughs> really unfair. But I, I almost got away with it because I saw them come, they saw the light, they had one of these little um, uh, oil lamps, and as they came close enough, I could see the light getting lighter and lighter. And I was sitting at the end of the chamber, maybe about 20 meters from where the bend was. 
And then two of the, one of these men put their head around, and they walked around, they saw me, and they immediately ran back. And I could understand them, because they were saying, there's a ghost at the end of the cave. <laughs> they thought I was a ghost. And I thought, yes, I've escaped. And I could hear them arguing, it can't be a ghost. Yeah, there is a ghost, I saw it. No, there can't be, yes it is. And so two people, they put their heads around, and then they sort of start talking, it's not a ghost, it's a western monk. No, it's a ghost, no, it's a western monk. No, it's a western monk. And then I realized I'd lost. <laughs> and about these 20 people came up to me, and they sat down in front of me, and they said, what country are you from? <laughs> What did your father do? What did your mother do? Why did you become a Oh God. And I realized from that time you cannot escape. <laughs> so you just let it happen. All my plans have never worked. So you don't make plans, you just adapt as things happen. So you're single and your plan is to get married. It doesn't happen. Something else happens. You're married and you want to get sin. It doesn't happen. So just go with the flow and stop planning. Enjoy whatever stage of this life you're at. Married, single, in a threesome, whatever you're at. Just no plans. Just enjoy it. As long as it's within, everybody knows and you're not deceiving anybody. So whatever it is, sort of, it's what you make of it is the most important. And if you want to be somewhere else, if you want to get that hay on the other side of the fence, it's always mouldy. So, just be where you are. Enjoy you know, what you have. You can always make amazing mangoes out of the most disgusting stuff in life. And you know, it's not about being single, it's not about being married, that's not the problem. What are you doing about it? How are you, how are you using this? What are you making out of this? Which means you have full opportunity whatever situation you are in life, to actually to grow, and even to get happiness, even if you are in prison, even if you have got cancer, if you've got some disease. Look at that Stephen Hawking in Cambridge, the great scientist, you know, wheelchair bound. Just look what he's doing with his life. So remember that. It's not the situation you're in, but what you make of it which gives you full freedom to be happy, no matter whether you're single, married, or whatever. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Very good. Okay, somebody went to my party on New Year's Eve. Okay, so have we got any questions? Any questions from here, first of all, about being single or being married? Okay, these are from overseas. Here we go, from Sydney, Malaysia and London. Here we go, first of all from Sydney, what advice can you give to a non-Buddhist dating a Buddhist and can a relationship be a success? Of course it can be a success. In Singapore, there is a disciple of mine, uh, she is a Buddhist, no he is a Buddhist, uh, he is married to a Muslim girl in Singapore. And this is no joke, they've got two children, one is a Christian, the other one is a Hindu. <laughs> Absolutely true. Father a Buddhist, wife a Muslim, one son a Christian, another son a Hindu. And for years I've been telling them to please have another child, have a Jew and get the full set. <laughs> because it's not whether you're a Buddhist a Muslim, an atheist, or whatever. It's what you do with that. And of course, you know, there are some, I'm a Buddhist, there are some Buddhists, you know, who are just not nice people to be around. You know, there was just too uh, boring, just too um, no, not smiling, not enjoying their life, not gaining any, any depth in their meditation, always telling other people what to do. I've known Buddhists like that. Are they, you know, are they good Buddhists? And it's just, you know, Christians, I know Christians who are just trying to convert everybody. I've also known Christians who could be good friends. Muslims as well. 
So it's not you know, whether you're a Muslim or Buddhist or a Christian, it's just what you make of your religion. That's the most important. So don't just think, I'm a Buddhist, I am better than everybody else. I've got the right religion. All you guys over there, you've got the second class religion. Not like Buddhism. And out of Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, we got the real original Buddhism. Not that Mahayana and Tibetan stuff with all the rituals. We got the very best. And Theravada Buddhism, the forest tradition, we are the real tradition. Not those guys who just, who just, you know, just watch TVs in the villages. And of the forest tradition, Ajahn Brahm tradition, that is the best. All these other forest traditions, they don't know what they're doing. People actually do that, you know, they think that they're the very best. And isn't there something wrong with that? So it's not, you know, whether you call yourself a Buddhist, it's what you do with that. Whether you're a kind, compassionate, peaceful, sort of um, a person who is generous and kind, virtuous. It's, those are the qualities, not the names. So the dating of Buddhist, I don't care, non-Buddhist dating of Buddhist, is that one kind person dating another kind person. If it's two kind persons, two virtuous persons dating each other, go for it. Not the name, but the qualities. From Malaysia, my relatives keep telling me that my parents give me life, therefore I must get married and have babies, otherwise I am being selfish. Please advise. Sounds like your parents are being selfish, <laughs> not you. Your parents gave you life. But remember, according to the stream of consciousness, the Buddhist idea is, if you hadn't got reborn in your parents' womb, you got reborn in some other womb. So it's, the parents never gave you life. You had life before you were born. Your parents gave you a room in their womb to rent for nine months. And they, and they gave you a house to live in, an education. Yeah, they gave you a lot. But you know, you also gave them a lot. When you have a child, you want a child. You get so much fun out of a child. So it's not just a one way. Parents, I gave everything to you. You never gave me anything back in return. Of course the kid gives you a lot of love and kindness and, and uh, happiness back in return. So now you've left home. You've left home. You've left home. Your parents should let you go. Be like the birds. The birds are wise. They sit on their eggs with sore bottoms for days and then they just work really hard feeding the little chicks when they're hatched and as soon as they teach the, the little babies <coughs> how to fly and as soon as the birds can fly, their mum and dad is off. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, once you know, you, you've looked after your kids, they've gone through university, you know, now they're, so they've got the degrees, they've got their jobs, get out, 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 out. But what do you mothers do? No, I like having my son around. <laughs> it's your problem. <laughs> so no, it's, you don't have to have, get married and have babies. Look, there's one of the biggest problems, you know, people are very keen on the, uh, looking after this planet Earth. We all know that one of the biggest problems on planet Earth is overpopulation. You just see, you know, I've only been here for 30 years in Perth, but just the growth in all the suburbs. When I first came here with Ajahn Jakaro, we used to go, just, it wasn't that far off, and we are just out in the bush, we could have a walk by the beach, no one was around. And then, I think that's, that's probably where Hillary's is now. And this is just totally empty, and now it's just, you have to go a long way to get any sort of solitude. Just how much more can we actually grow? We have to sort of, you know, stop somewhere. And that means not having so many babies. So, you can say, you are doing your best for the planet by not having any babies. So you're not being selfish, you're sacrificing yourself for the, the future sustainability of Mother Earth. And from London, if I'm always content with whatever state I'm in, i.e. being single or attached, doesn't that mean I'll be too passive to make changes that could have actually improved my life? What do you mean improve your life? Sometimes we always want to improve our life, and what happens? We make it worse. So sometimes, can't you be content with the life you have? Sometimes you improve it, and it makes it worse. So sometimes we're always into improving too much, and not being grateful and being um, respecting what we already have. 
There's too much improving going on and not enough appreciation. You people who are married, do you want to improve your husband? Would you like to improve him? If I could give you a magic potion, take one of these every day and your husband will be improved, would you be interested? <laughs> take this magic potion and your wife will be improved. What's that old joke about this, this guy? Never been to a city before in his life. And you know, he went to this, one of these big shopping centres you know, with his wife. You know, he's in his 70s. And you know, he's, he saw an elevator for the first time in his life. He never knew what an elevator was. So he saw this old woman going in this elevator. The doors closed. The numbers went out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Stopped and then came down again. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And this beautiful young lady came out. And he told his son, son, go and get your mother. <laughs> That's an old show, but very funny. <laughs> Why do you always want to improve people? Can't you love them for who they are? And that's this terrible thing about improving everybody, improving yourself. Can't you appreciate what you have? We have a huge amount, and your partner in life is gorgeous. Can't you just appreciate them? And what's it like to be appreciated by someone else? Someone else loves you for who you are, and they don't want to improve you. Isn't that brilliant? And how many people do you know, you see them, they're always giving you advice on how to do things better. Doesn't that suck after a while? Can't you just be appreciated and loved? Be careful that word improving. Because that just caused so much stress in life. So yeah, I think you can be a bit more passive. And uh, don't make too many changes. You already spend a whole life making changes. And is, is life ever finished that way? There's always more changes to do. My saying is, I'd better finish off quick because it's nine o'clock. When you go home this evening, don't try and improve your kitchen by washing up every dish and cup and knife and fork and spoon. Before you do all that washing up, please, Count how many clean dishes there are, how many dirty dishes there are, and if the clean ones outnumber the dirty ones, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, what happens? You, to, to, you spend all your weekends, all your holidays, doing things and never appreciating enjoying life. Always trying to change the people you live with rather than appreciating them. Always changing yourself rather than appreciating yourself. Try to change your kids rather than loving them. And I'll tell you the secret. If you just appreciate your kids and love them for who they are, they get better. <laughs> if you appreciate yourself and love yourself as you are, then you improve. When you try and change, often things get worse. When you love things for who they are, it's like the sun shining in the garden. And then the flowers grow. Okay, there we go. So thank you again for coming to the first talk of 2014. So now we can, I've already gone up way over time, so now we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha, and those of you who have any questions, you can line up here, and uh, I will go to the toilet if it's too long. <laughs> but please, no one come and ask me. They always do this when I tell that story about the cave. If don't come and say, Ajahn Brahm, what country do you come from? What does your father do? What does your mother do? What do so if you're going to ask a question, ask a sensible one. Thank you very much. <laughs>